Well, we've been in this series taking you inside Rock Creek. Who are we? Who do we believe that God has called us to be? And what role do you have to play a part of that? And today's title, if you look at the passage, you go, this doesn't sound like it matches. Life is fun, and this guy's going through one of the worst uh, situations of all of his life. What we're talking about today is this. There's nothing like Nothing like serving as a part of a team and watching God work in and through you to change someone's life forever. I would say this, that that's really the mark of mature faith. When faith begins to lead you to live it out. But for so many people, they never get to that. They never get to that. They just kind of stay in the rookie season of their faith. And we've been trying to teach you guys, like, like you've got a role to play on this team. We want you growing and getting better, right? We want you to understand that you've got a position and you need to be. We, we like rookies. We like that, right? But we want people who grow in their faith and understand what God has called them to and then understand the role and position that God has put them in to make a difference and impact for the kingdom of God. And so, do you guys know this or not? When you go to some restaurants, they have secret menus. Do you guys know this? That you can order things that, that aren't on the menu. Do you guys like doing this, right? So at Rock Creek, we have a, a vision statement, but then there's like one right underneath this, okay? We want you to know God, and we also, we also want you to know a lot about the game of baseball, all right? And so baseball illiteracy just will not be tolerated. It won't be tolerated, okay? And I know this is against the rules. I want you to turn the person next to you, even if you don't know them, and tell them you're my partner. Tell them right now. You can talk. It's okay. It's not, a, it's not a trick. You're my partner, all right? So we're going to find out. We're going to find out what is going on here, all right? Did you know that on a baseball field, everyone's wearing a glove, but they're not wearing the same glove? They're not wearing the same glove. So tell the person next to you which positions are wearing these gloves. Tell them. Go ahead. You can be wrong. Just tell them. Got it? All right. This is... This is an infielder's glove, specifically a middle infielder's glove. And you can see because the webbing is so small, this is made for quickness. And so if you see a middle infielder right before the pitch is coming, don't watch the ball. Don't watch the ball. And you'll see people, they're getting ready, and their stance to get ready in the middle infield is not the same as the stance to get ready in first and third. It's not the stance that's getting ready in the outfield because they've got to do different things. This web is designed to get the ball in and out quickly. Why? Because the ball comes quickly, and they've got to throw it to first base to get it out quickly. This is a center fielder's glove. Look at the difference between the webbing. You want to know why the webbing is so big? Because this is not built for quickness, right? Center fielders have to cover a lot of ground. And if you've ever been at full speed trying to catch a fly ball in the gap, this gives you a better chance than this does to make the play. But we're not stopping there. We're not stopping there. You got your partner, okay? Middle infielder glove. And tell the person next to you what this is. It's not a catcher's mitt. Some of you stopped, right? So, some of you are so excited because it's the first time you've known something in church. Today's your Sunday, <laughs> right? This is a first baseman's mitt, and it's designed specifically here to cover up for the faults of the other infielders. This is for scooping the ball. That's what makes it, because if you got these fingers can kind of get in the way of that, even though you got to scoop sometimes, but that's what a, first, and if this was really a good first baseman's mitt, and if you got kids and grandkids, we want it to be left-handed. That makes things better, right? And then this, you know what this is. This is a, tell your partner next to you, it's a catcher's mitt. Some of you are learning for the first time in your life, they're wearing different gloves, right? So this is designed, the padding in here, the padding in here is designed so that a fastball just doesn't break the hand of the catcher because it's coming at a high velocity. And it's also designed for quickness because a catcher's got to get the ball to the throwing zone quickly or you give up stolen bases and you start to lose. Different designs, same team. Different designs, same purposes. This is what it looks like when a church is doing it right. 
and you're there, man. You're at second base and you're playing your role. You're working in the food bank and all of a sudden you see folks that are working with kids. It's like a center fielder with this huge web, right? And you watch them run down a fly ball and you go, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And you know that you couldn't do it because that's not how you were designed. And center fielders are not more important than second basemen. It takes everybody on the field doing their job, understanding their assignment, and working within how they were put together to pull this thing off. Do you know what's most frustrating? Can I tell you what's most frustrating? Not, not just for a baseball coach. What's most frustrating for a baseball coach is the same thing that's most frustrating for a pastor. When you can spot talent a mile away that never gets off the bench. I mean, some of you guys have gloves that are perfectly designed for what God has called you to, but all you do is spectate Sunday after Sunday. And if you get enough people like that on the team, you start to lose. But if you can get a group of people together who understand what they're called to and simultaneously understand that there is a unique gifting and purpose and then all of them start to work together, you can make a difference and impact for the kingdom of God. But you got to get in the game. And, and, and I would say this, real, growing, mature, Authentic faith always leads me to live it out in my real life. I, I don't know people who have come to know Christ and are growing in their walk with Christ that are not actively looking for ways to make a difference for the kingdom of God. It's the backdrop for one of the most, I think, famous illustrations of all time. You've probably even heard the term Good Samaritan. You may not know that it was an illustration. It probably didn't even happen. The background of it is a lawyer, someone who is intelligent beyond his wildest dreams in the law of Moses, is trying to get Jesus, not cornered, but backed into answering him, okay, where's the line? And this is not in your notes, but the conversation begins in Luke 10. And this lawyer says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You already know he's asking the wrong question. He's not even looking outside of himself for a savior. He's looking for the standard and line that he has to live up to. And Jesus, so masterful in his debate and conversation, he asked him, how do you read the law? And the lawyer replies correctly, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly, do this and you will surely live. Jesus is trying to get him to understand what we must understand, and that's this. If that's the standard, we fall short. If the standard is in every area of my life, never a blemish, never a moment that I don't fall short of loving God with all of my heart and loving others, then I'm going to fall short on my own effort. But the lawyer is trying to justify his position. And so he says this, yeah, but, but who's my neighbor? The question in the Greek is this, do I have to go to the other neighborhood or just love the people next to me? Do I have to love people three houses down or do I have to love the person that's right next to me? What is the, ex the extent of the Greek here, Jesus? I need to know the line because that's what I'm going to do. He's missed the heart of the matter. And you go, how could he do it? It's the same thing that happens. When people ask, okay, what, what do I have to give? Is it on the net or the gross? Same question. I mean, come on, Jason, I'm serving one night a week. Is that enough? Same question. You remember, I taught you. We're not serving, giving, and going to try to earn the love of God. That only leads to guilt and performance-based religious self-righteousness. We're serving and giving and going because we're compelled by the love of God. This lawyer wants to know where's the line, and he's missed the heart of the matter. 
You know what the right question should be when you come to real faith in Jesus is this. How much impact could we make? How many wins could we have? The real question for someone on a team is this. How many plays could I make? What if I'm in the perfect position? Not how much little practice could we get. Like how good could we be? In the church world, it's things like this. Like what if? What if the food bank wasn't big enough and God has more for us? What if the facility wasn't big enough and God wanted to do more through the church at Rock Creek? That never happens through people who are asking what's the minimum. It only happens through people who are willing, obedient, sacrificial, and so in love with Jesus that they've come to the conclusion that there's a God-given, Christ-centered mission and purpose for their life as part of a church, and they want to see God make a difference and impact in their life. Man, and I would say this, the reason why so many church people are apathetic The reason why so many church people seem to be down is because there's never been a moment in their faith that they got in the game and asked what kind of difference I can make. You want to know why? There is a fullness that is found in the kingdom of God when you begin to pour out your heart and serve others that the rest of this world can't offer you. And until you begin to understand that, You'll always just kind of be a spectator watching. Jesus answers his question, and he does it with a story. But everyone who's listening couldn't have possibly imagined what would happen next. And he uses two examples, two people that should have gotten it right. The most religious of the religious The ones that everybody else should have looked looked to. The people who never miss church. And he says, they're not the ones. And it's obvious that the man was in need. Here's the reply in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. And that would have been common on this road. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And so the idea here is this, that the need is clear. Like sometimes you got to ask, but many times you don't. Many times it's really evident. And a priest, a priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man and he passed by on the other side. And how quick we are to say shame. Instead of inserting ourselves, what if I get hurt? I don't even know anything about bandaging people. I'm really busy. I got to get to church. Surely someone will help him. I'll pray about that. Followed up by Levi, who came to the place and saw him and passed by on the other side. Context Levites were the tribe descended from Levi. And the priests were select qualified men from this tribe, and they had responsibility over the aspects of the tabernacle or temple worship. So all priests would have been Levites, but not all Levites were priests. The point of the story is this. The lawyer should have been able to imitate these people. If he wanted to know how the law is lived out, He should have been able to look at the priest and the Levite, and Jesus says they got it wrong. Forever illuminating something that should be really confronting to us, and it's this. That you can have biblical knowledge and miss the kingdom of God. That you can never miss church and miss a life of faith. That you can spend your whole life as a spectator understanding the kingdom of God, but never walking in step with Jesus. And in verse 33, when Jesus says, but a Samaritan, the crowd would have gasped. The idea that a despised, outside, lowly Samaritan would be the hero of a story and a Levite and a priest 
would be the examples of those who missed it would have been outside of the realm of anything that could be comprehended. Why? Because in 722 B.C., Assyria took captive Israel and took most of the people back with them. And then they brought Gentiles in and they resettled the land. And these Gentiles came in and brought with them their pagan idols and worship and had their own temple. And then they began to intermarry with the remaining Jews. And so from that time forward, to the, to the Jewish people, the Samaritans would have been half-breeds, ethnically polluted, religiously confused, morally debased. They couldn't stand them, and the Samaritans couldn't stand them. And it's Jesus who says, this Samaritan, he gets it right. As he traveled, he came to the place where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. It's the first separation between him and the religious elite. And so what happens is what follows when there's compassion. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. It's an antiseptic. And then he put the man on his own donkey, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii. This is two full days of pay. And gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. And Jesus looks at the lawyer and says, which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? And notice in 37, the lawyer can't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. He says, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus replied, go and do likewise. Now, now you've got to get this. Simultaneously, Jesus is showing us the standard that we're called to and illuminating how far we fall short. That this is who we've been called to be, but our only hope of salvation is not in our own effort. It's in Christ. One of the applications here is this. The closer you get to the heart of God and the deeper your faith, the more it starts to change how you live in your real life. You see, one of the things that I want you to write down is this. The love of Jesus leads us to compassion. The love of Jesus leads us to compassion. I really battled this this week. I'll be honest, early in the week, I wasn't sure if this was the right passage. And I thought to myself, maybe, maybe I should walk through with you guys all of the different spiritual gifts and help you understand all of that. Maybe that's the point. And it's just it's kind of back and forth. And this is a little bit normal because uh, God just wants to spend time with me. And so he's not going to give me the whole sermon at once. And so it's just a daily walking together. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, is this what I'm supposed to do, God? Just kind of get me. What is it? And I landed here and it's, it's because of this. There is nothing more frustrating than watching folks who know exactly what role they're supposed to play, but their heart not being inclined to do so. I can teach you how to play the position that God has called you to, but I can't give you the heart to do it. I don't know people who have deep, mature, authentic faith, and one of the measures of that faith is their love for others. What happens when we come to know Christ is we get a new heart that is a reflection of the heart of Christ and the very presence of God lives inside of us. And the deeper your faith, the more you begin to love others. And I would challenge you with this. If it's been a long time since you had compassion towards someone in need, you need to have a real conversation about whether or not you have a relationship with Christ. And I'm walking and I'm thinking, okay, God, would you just make it so simple for me? I don't want to miss this. And I don't want to preach what you don't want me to preach. Would you just walk? And I'm in my morning walk in my neighborhood and there's little curves and stuff like this. And I come around the corner. I told Mark and Greg this. I told them you guys would never believe that this happened to me. It was Monday morning. And I turn the corner 
and there's a guy laying in the sidewalk covered in blood. And I thought, maybe I'm supposed to preach this. And he'd had knee replacement surgery and thought he could go on a walk. And I started to think this. There's people hurting everywhere. And as our culture becomes more like this, a church that's compassionate should shine like a beacon in the middle of the night. The more compassionate you become, the more you start to want to serve and the more you get off of the bench and in the game and God starts working in and through you and simultaneously deepens your faith and widens the breadth of your impact. This looks like Jesus. When he saw him, he took pity on him. What does it sound like? Matthew 9. Jesus went to the towns and the villages, and he's teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And look at this. He's healing. He's healing disease and sickness. He's caring for people in a physical way. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Boy, for the teenager here, and you're just here because you happen to be born in a home where mom and dad make you go to church. And your heart's not inclined. You need to meet Jesus. For the person that's comfortable watching the direction of our culture, and there's not been a moment in your heart that there's compassion, you need to have a real conversation about your faith. Because Jesus arrives and there's a new direction and there's new devotion and there's new desires and I want to make a difference. My favorite people in the world are people who see the distance between the way things are and the way things should be. And the heart of Christ gets right in the middle of that and they see what? That they can make a difference. Jesus had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then this is us today. And he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This is true in church all across the world. The most work is done by very few people. Can you imagine what would happen if all of a sudden, a congregation came together and started praying, Jesus, would you help me to see people the way you see them? Would you open my eyes to the difference I could make? I want my life to count for something, to make a difference, and there's nothing more fun than pouring out your life to be there for somebody. And God uses that time and time and time and time again to make a difference in someone's life. I wouldn't be here today if Tommy Bates in high school hadn't seen what could be. And compassion made him show up to our games. Compassion made him write those notes. I wouldn't be here today if Stephen Smith in college, if Mark and Greg, compassion leads us. Leads us to what? Number two, the love of Jesus leads us to action. You don't ever meet a compassionate person that's not a person of action. It changes the way that you live. I love these people. You want to know why? These people pull up on Sunday and they see 36th Street and they don't say somebody ought to clean it. They turn around in the car and they go, we got to clean this baby. I love that you get, it. I'm telling you, you get around disaster relief guys, this is them. They're like, we're cutting down something. I don't know what, but we're going to cut down something today. And it fired, I want to be around those people, right? While everybody else is complaining about the problem. The good Samaritans, moved by compassion, start saying what? Man, I've got to do something about this. While everyone else is complaining about the next generation and threats in schools, someone says, what if I could disciple one? Well, everyone, a, a post is easy. God's called us to walk across the road, to get down in the dirt, 
Put someone on our donkey. Pay the money for the innkeeper. Make sure that it leads us to action. And you go, Jason, I think you're being a little bit dramatic here. I think James goes much further than I do. James would tell you this. A faith that hasn't led to action is a fraudulent faith. It's not that action leads us to faith. It's that a heart for Christ always leads you to love others. Look at what James wrote. He says, what good is it, brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can that kind of faith save them? And then he gives us the example. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? James is saying, oh, you say, I'll pray for you about that, but you don't help. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. And the good Samaritan got it. Went over and took his own oil, his own donkey, his own money. And I'm telling you this, there is no amount of eternal action, no matter the cost in the temporary, that when we get to heaven, you would trade. If you want to live the life that God has called you to, to make a difference and impact, at some point, faith leads you to move and you cannot stay where you are and go with God. We, we, American Christianity, have turned faith into a spectator sport. And you need to read this passage and understand. I, I used to say, when I was a young preacher, I would say things like this, and it would be the, aha, I got you moment. And you say things to get the, oh. There's going to be so many church people who miss the kingdom of God. Because their whole life, they just set at a distance. And man, an authentic faith in Christ, the depth of your faith, always leads you to love others. It always does. If there's never been this burning desire in your heart to take Jesus as he is to people as they are, you need to ask some hard questions about your faith in Jesus. And and you go, I have to do everything. God's calling you to something. God's calling you to something. And our authentic faith leads us, leads us to action. Third one is this. An authentic faith, this love of Jesus, it leads us to sacrifice. It leads us to sacrifice. This person's asking, not what I have to give up to the line. It's, it's what difference could I make? How much of an impact could I, could I give? Hebrews 13, 16 says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. The love of the good Samaritan was costly for him in the moment, eternally beneficial to the man that was hurt and to him. You can't outgive God. And, and every time you talk about this, there's always this pushback. Have you ever entertained that it might be Satan? Every time you talk about something like this, there's always this thought, I think, for people, oh, preachers trying to get me. Have you ever thought in a million years that the reason why you're stagnant in your faith is because it's going to take a step I've never met anybody who lived their life with compassion for the kingdom of God, action for the kingdom of God, sacrificing, giving, and going for the kingdom of God, and regretted that. And those people would tell you, you go find them, they would tell you that it is the most fun to watch the eternal purposes of God flow through your temporary life, whatever the cost is. And if you get enough people in a church who believe that it's big enough 
for someone else to have compassion or action or sacrifice, that church won't make it. But what if? What if you and I were perfectly positioned to be good Samaritans and to constantly be crossing over the road? I want to show you something. I'm not leaving. There are, God's so smart. There's objects in your life that you never recover from. And this is one for me. I never see a push broom and don't get a little bit emotional about the potential of the church at Rock Creek. And I know it sounds silly. But I was 25 years old on the Friday before our first service here. And can I be honest with you? I, I, I was really just hired as a student ministry hired gun. And I wasn't really interested in anything else. I thought, let's get the Sunday service out of the way so that I can make a difference. And it's Friday, it's late. Everybody had already gone home. And I'm up here, I'm getting some things ready. I didn't think anybody else was here. And, and right down here around the bathrooms, I, I heard something and I peeked around the corner. And I just kind of eased out. And all the lights were off out here. And they had done some finishing with the rocks, and there was dust everywhere. And I turned the corner, and I saw Mark, our senior pastor, with no one here. And he's walking up and down the town hall, and he's just push brooming. And I kind of looked around and thought, is this a photo op? Like, is this just about, you know? And I started to listen and he was praying. And right down there by the, where the homeless bin is at that corner, I told Jesus, I want to work here the rest of my life. Because he understood this, if it doesn't lead to this, doesn't really matter. And the moment you start to think that you and I are not called to this, we've missed the kingdom of God. I want to ask you, I want to ask you to think if there's a possibility that we as the church at Rock Creek could make even more of an eternal difference if you got in the game. If all of a sudden following Jesus wasn't a spectator sport for you anymore, and compassion led to action and came to fruition in sacrifice. I want you to look on the back of your worship guide. In the back of your worship guide, I've kind of identified for you all of the different ways that you can get involved. And I've broken them down for you in your different giftings, from discipleship to serving to caring. I think this, I think I could back up that there's not a gifting that you could have biblically that you could not exercise here at the church at Rock Creek. And here in a minute, when you leave, right on the other side of this wall, we've divided up into three sections, discipleship, serve, and care. And you can sign up face-to-face -face with a real person today, and you'd go, oh, Jason, man, just give me a Bible and a group to teach like I'm in discipleship. And some of you guys are going, oh, it's not discipleship. I need to run a camera. I need to serve. And some of you guys are going, oh, you, that's worthless. Like I need to be caring for people and feeding people. And it takes everybody in every position for us to be who God's called us to be. And you can do that today and you go, oh, Jason, I'm too much of an introvert. I'm not signing up for anything face-to-face. -face. What, what if they asked me something? Great, 
Go to the website right here, churchatrockcreek.com, volunteer. It's got a survey on there so that you can get involved right now. You can see someone in person. You can sign up online and you go, oh, but we got a million things to do. Awesome. Your blue envelope right there. Write your name and cell phone number on it and your email and on the back, write down where you want to get involved and you go, oh, but I'm not writing anything down. The government's tracking me. Awesome. Text me. That's my personal cell phone number. And you may say, okay, Jason, I don't even know what glove I'm supposed to be wearing. I've already got a spiritual gift survey loaded up in my text messages to send you. You don't have an excuse to walk around the other side of the road. You don't. And if we get a bunch of folks who believe that compassion and action and sacrifice is something that someone else should do, listen to me. God will work around the church at Rock Creek instead of working through us. And I really do believe this. I know that this sounds crazy, and I'm finishing right here. I really do believe in the midst of a world that seems it's taken every step to the appropriate return of Christ and a political season that seems to have us more at each other like this and a morality of culture that just seems to be eroding, I really believe that our church is perfectly positioned to make a difference and impact for the kingdom of God for generations to come. It's going to take a push broom. In giving, in compassion, and very soon, very soon, you and I will be in heaven together. And how incredible to hear Jesus say, that little ragtag bunch, they didn't even know what glove to wear. And they made so many errors, but they got on the field. And they took my name and made much of it in central Arkansas. That, that I'm pleased with. Father, thank you so much that you take the foolish, of, foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And so I'm praying this, that somebody would go and do likewise. And that we would never be the same. And that we would make a dent for the gospel in central Arkansas and around the world that would last for generations. We love you so much and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, our ushers are going to get in place right now. Look at, the, look at these guys. They're so athletic. Look at them, right? They're moving. All right. Get your envelope out. If you've never been to Rock Creek, if you've never given, maybe that was your takeaway today. You're like, hey, we've got to step forward in that. You can use your envelope to do that. You can go online. You can do at our home. We re, uh, uh, set it up where it just comes out every week, right? And it's so important to do that. Guys, go ahead and begin to receive the offering. If it comes by too quick, there's bins on the way out so that you can drop them, so that you can drop them there, all right? Mom and Dad, in a couple of weeks, October the 4th, a Friday night. Well, I lost my thing. There it is. Hey, movie night on the lawn. Movie night on the lawn. We're praying it's not going to be 187 degrees. And mom and dad, if you don't follow Rock Creek Kids on Facebook, go do that because you're going to get to kind of vote on what movie. And it's an awesome night. Um, all of the concession stand stuff, huge screen. Um, we want kids to have memories at church that make them happy. Does that make sense? And, and so we want to help you uh, make memories as well. Memories as well. So that is October the 4th. They're collecting a, a couple more of these. Um, on the back of here, uh, you can find out exactly how to get involved. And then underneath this, if this is your first time to ever be at Rock Creek, that's Paul right there. Paul's the nicest guy I know in the world. I mean that, Paul. And uh, Paul's got a gift for you. It's a wonderful, wonderful church gift. We'd love for you to be a part of the Rock Creek. Unless you're a perfect person, then go to another church, okay? Because that'll mess us up. That'll mess us up, okay? And so if you're not a perfect person, but you want to be a part of what Rock Creek is doing, we'd love to have you, all right?